you go, no, yeah, Why yeah. Where you, go, where you going, D? Phone the police. <laughs> we are the police. We're, I'm PC Specky Speckless. Hey, my name is Chris, and welcome back to Instant English. Today, we're in the vibrant city of Glasgow for a language and cultural adventure. Known for its rich industrial heritage, breathtaking architecture, and friendly locals, Glasgow has much to offer. In this video, we'll be asking locals IELTS speaking questions to see if they can achieve a minimum score of seven, or in other words, an upper intermediate level. For those of you that don't know what the IELTS test is, it's a test that students must take to prove their level of English if they want to study or live abroad in an English speaking country. The speaking section is broken into three parts. Part one is a casual interview where you discuss familiar topics about yourself. Part two is called the long turn. This is where you share thoughts on a given topic for around two minutes, so basically a mini speech. And part three is a discussion where you engage in deeper conversations about a specific topic. And just to give you a little bit more context, today's topic will be culture. Now let's meet the locals. My name's Ross, I work at the university. I'm from, well, I guess the west coast of Scotland originally, but work in Glasgow currently. My name's Kieran. I'm originally from Ireland. I live in Glasgow. I'm Katrina Curry, and I am from the Isle of Mull. Okay, I'm Daisy, I'm from Brighton. Are there any festivals or celebrations unique to your culture that you look forward to? I do look forward to Christmas, I guess, but I'm not religious as such, I just uh, look forward to that time of year because I guess the kind of crisp weather and the alcohol and the celebrations and eating and everything else that goes with it. Yeah, I guess uh, Christmas is pretty big every year, December 25th. It's a big time for kind of family and seeing old friends and things like that. Festivals, arts festivals. Um, I like to go back to my hometown of Galway for the Galway Arts Festival. Also, I lived in Edinburgh for many years and was a frequent uh, attendee of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival too. Well, on, so where I grew up, uh, we have a music festival every year, which is like a big part of our culture because it celebrates Scottish sort of traditional music. There's quite a lot of beer involved um, and it's just, it's a kind of like a traditional music session. They have lots of the pubs, obviously the pubs are open all the time uh, and there's music playing all day sort of through to the night. Probably birthdays. Mm. I'm not a religious family, so like Christmas is kind of whatever. Birthday's quite a big one, big family, so we always get together. Bonfire night, mate. <laughs> Why? Cause, mate, it's like one time a year, mate, when you can fucking build a big fuck off fire, mate. It just. How does your culture celebrate significant milestones like weddings or birthdays? Usually, birthdays, you would maybe just go out for drinks, go out for food, maybe a couple of presents, nothing too elaborate. Maybe, like, if it was my 40th, I might do something a bit more out there, but still in my 30s, so. Three more years before that happens. Usually with like a nice meal, or it obviously kind of like meeting up with pal with friends and things. Maybe occasionally would do an activity. I'm not actually a big sort of celebrator of my birthday. Well, my wife likes to put it this way: uh, you drink to celebrate, and you drink to drown your sorrows. So it's kind of uh, a lot of it is centered around drinking, but a lot of dancing too, I think. Uh, a lot of uh, letting loose with emotions um, that aren't always let loose with. Yeah, I think that probably sums it up <laughs> succinctly enough. I'd say food is pretty central. So there's normally a big meal. Often it's cooked by loads of different people. So you kind of all come together and do it, which is quite fun. There's normally like a centerpiece of something, whether that's a cake or like, I don't know, roasts are quite big in the UK and like having a bird and I don't know. There's decoration to the meal as well. How do you typically show gratitude or thanks? I guess usually I would personally thank somebody, maybe send them a text, even if it's a work situation, probably an email, just to say thanks, thanks for that, just so they're aware that I am happy with what's been done and not that favours and such not don't go unnoticed. I usually like to buy people stuff, you know, if I'm out with my pals and they do me a turn, <laughs> I'll buy them a bottle of wine. <laughs> and that's my gratitude. <laughs> buying them buying them something back to show that I'm grateful for it. Plus I don't ever leave my pals out. If I'm on it, they're on it. <laughs> yeah. uh, by saying thank you, um, depends what it is. Maybe you give someone a bunch of flowers, a box of chocolates, a nice packet of biscuits. Um, maybe sort of 
taking them out for some drinks, maybe a nice meal, kind of all, all really depends on what, what I need to show gratitude for. Well, usually it's, uh, usually it's verbal, but sometimes it can be in kind. So if you are, you know, given a good turn by somebody, you want to kind of return that. Um, you want to do a good turn for somebody else. You also kind of feel, you know, if someone buys you a coffee or something or buys you dinner or makes you dinner, you want to reciprocate that. You want to kind of uh, give it back a bit. A big part of the culture here also in going back to the drinking example is buying around, which means buying a number of drinks for you and your friends. You take it in turns to do that. So depending on the group, it can get quite messy. There's quite a lot of rounds going in. Either a small gift, giving their time, a thank you card. It depends how close you are to someone. What are some values or principles that you place strong emphasis on? A lot of my values, would you like in the work, would you say? Maybe you want to do a good job at your work. You need to, you want, not you need to be reassured. You want uh, people to acknowledge that you have done a good job, uh, keep others happy, know that everything's going well, good, good feedback. I guess principles. Like if I was running a job, you usually want good timekeeping, uh, good rapport with the people you're working with. And well, I, kind of, I grew up with quite a strong work ethic. Uh, my parents have uh, were self-employed and had their own business, so I think it was kind of drilled into me in quite a young age. You know that you kind of show up, you're reliable, and that yeah, like I think my dad would disown me if I took a sick day, if I threw a sick day, So. I don't know, shared time, but I don't know, maybe the values are placed in the wrong areas sometimes. But time, people give time to each other and that is valued. Now if you want to take the IELTS test yourself, you need to find a tutor. And I highly recommend Live XP. Live XP is a platform where you can find the best English language tutors for one-on-one -on -one private classes. I highly recommend this platform if you want to speak with native speakers while at the same time having natural conversations, enhancing your pronunciation and even polishing your accent. You can download Live XP on your phone or use it on your laptop. The main reason I love this platform is because you can filter the tutors by the country they are from. So you can look for a teacher from the UK, the USA, Australia, Canada, and so on. Also, you can select a tutor that can help you with specific goals, which will help you to save time and allow you to enjoy the classes more. And if you're worried that you might be too busy, don't worry. You can choose the schedule that suits you best, so you never have to miss a class again. Here's a clip of me enjoying my Spanish class a couple of days ago. My teacher, Kevin, was amazing. He was able to clearly explain the grammar that we were learning in that class. I already have a fairly good level of Spanish and he was able to identify this pretty quickly. This made the class more engaging because it was challenging but also understandable, which of course gave me more confidence to speak in Spanish. On top of that, Kevin used professional materials and made notes that I could review later in my free time. If you check out the description below, you will find a link that will allow you to get a trial class for only 99 cents. And when you're ready to subscribe to the platform, make sure to use the second link. This will give you 30% off your subscription. By the way, when you have subscribed, all the teacher's prices are exactly the same. Now let's get back to the IELTS questions. Describe a memorable experience you had while interacting with somebody from a different cultural background. You must say where you were, who you were with, what you were doing, and explain what you learned from the ex experience. Well, an experience, I used to live in Brisbane for two and a half years, that was uh, about 2012. Over in Australia, we'd uh, celebrate Anzac, it was an uh, Australian New Zealand kind of day, which is something I'd never even heard of before until I was out there. It was a, a massive big deal out there, and they, they made these special cookies for the celebration, Anzac cookies, so called. Um, I did that with a bunch of my Australian colleagues at the time, obviously had a few beers, as they quite often do over there. I just learned that obviously there's different parts to different countries. I guess growing up in the west coast of Scotland, it was quite sheltered, so you just had your re-existence in your local town. You didn't really see much of the outside world. So last year I went to the Faroe Islands with one of my friends. Uh, part of the reason we went was because my friend is big into um, she started following the women's um, football team, so as well as fo following the Scottish national team, uh, she's now the men's national team. She's now started following the women's national team, and there was an opportunity to go and see the Faroe Islands play the Scottish women's um, national team. Whilst we were there, 
it became quite apparent to me how um, football was a massive part of their kind of their culture, um, and there, you know, there was lots of it was very well attended, and I really took me by surprise that a nation the, si the size of the Faroe Islands, which is 10% of the population of Scotland, so I think the population is about 54,000 people, um, could field a women's national team. You know, football is obviously a massive part of them. Um, it was very family orientated. There was lots of children running around. So that was like a kind of not a big culture shock to me, but that to me just became very apparent. It was something that was very kind of important to their culture. I've been to Iceland a couple of times and really it's a really great country. First time I was there, I was there kind of traveling around for a while with friends and camping and things like that. And then we went to a festival outside of Reykjavik, which is the capital city. On the first day of the festival, we smuggled in uh, some Scotch whiskey to the event. Uh, we kind of no knew that Icelandic alcohol was kind of expensive and maybe not very good. So we brought in some uh, Scotch whiskey and we were in good form and you know, very happy uh, having done that. And we ended up talking to this group of guys who were from a place in not only Iceland, but like rural, rural Iceland. So they were from the Vestman Islands, which is a kind of islands of islands of kind of fishermen and only I think a few hundred maybe population or something like that. So these guys that came down and were very, very well oiled, much more than we were actually. And they just mostly communicated in kind of broken English and kind of uh, noises. It very well. Two two guys had very big beards. One guy didn't. So the big beard thing—that's a Scandinavian thing, I think. We ended up kind of exchanging alcohol with them. So they had this stuff called um, it's not Brennevin, but it's another kind of alcohol. Can't think of the name. Probably appropriately enough, I can't remember it but it tastes very much like licorice and it's kind of salty. So it was actually quite unpleasant. Two days ago, uh, I was doing a dissertation interview and I was interviewing a pregnant Syrian woman. And we were sat in Brighton Marina on a bench in the sun. I found her on the internet, just Googling random people. And we had an interview and then we ended up talking about a bunch of other stuff. Probably learned from this experience that people you didn't necessarily know you'd be able to get along with, there's always a commonality there. And if you just take time to find the common ground, listen, you'll generally find it. In what ways has globalisation affected local cultures? I think with big companies coming into towns and villages, it kind of, they lose a bit of identity. You don't have your, as many independent, like uh, unique kind of shops to certain areas, unique selling points, like some towns might be famous for coffee, some might be for soap or whatever, or seafood. Okay, so um, I come from a small community on the west coast of Scotland where there was quite a strong sort of culture way of living. Um, and I think it's become apparent through various reasons that there's a lot of um, what they would call incomers that have moved to the island and that the kind of our sort of traditions and cultures are now probably quite quickly being erased, eradicated. Some of them are still there, but I know kind of from the time when I was like a teenager to now, a lot of those traditions are, are no longer there. And I think that's, so I, I would say like the traditions are being diluted. Where I grew up in Galway is much, much more multicultural, multinational than it was when I was kind of a younger kid. It's quite a lot of different nationalities and different languages, different races, which I think kind of sometimes can bring, I suppose, issues of, of people kind of integrating together. But one of the good things I've noticed being back home is that the effect actually seems to have just been quite, I wouldn't say, like, I wouldn't want to use the word natural, but organic maybe or something like that, that there has been a new kind of Irish identity that's come out of that experience. I would actually say less than we think. Everyone was terrified of it, like in the 90s. And then I think actually in reality, places have their own identity. Things don't change that quickly. Obviously, we may all know more cultural references, but in the place specifically, I think everywhere has got its own identity. What advantages can businesses gain from having employees from a wide range of backgrounds? Um, well, I think it depends on the, the type of business. People from different backgrounds can bring different perspectives, and different, ways, different ways of doing things, different experiences. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it just kind of depends on, you know, if, I think probably to go back to, you know, if it's a traditional business, 
then you know maybe their unique selling point is that I've got traditional ways of doing things, um, you know, and it's potentially been in a family for years. But you know, sometimes those businesses benefit from a new set of eyes, a, a fresh perspective. It's good to see how they do things over there, how, what their kind of skill sets are, what they learn, how, how they go through university, if it's any different to what they learn here. Because I guess they do the same roles back over there as they do here, but I guess it's, it's just this, it's more eye-opening to see how they, they go about their day, even like their working hours, you know, what they do in the evenings. I think exactly that, like everywhere brings something unique and using that to learn as much as you can is going to be beneficial. You have more angles, people have different experiences, there are different ways to do things always, so. So, the people of Glasgow did amazing on the outs test. I would probably give them an eight out of nine. I would just mark them down a little bit because they weren't prepared for the test. Some of their answers were a little bit disjointed. They didn't know what to say sometimes, but in general, they use some great natural expressions. If you want to continue practicing your English, check out this video. Click it, go on, click it. Don't forget to smash the like button and I'll see you next time.